From the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis, this is Indiana Issues. Here's your host, Abdul Hakeem Shabazz. And thank you for joining us in this edition of Indiana Issues. Lots of things to get to today. The Mueller investigation concludes, or does it? Uh, lots of things at the State House as we are under that 30-day window with respect to bias crimes and other matters. Our guest today, a really interesting panel, our good friend, uh, Republican conservative commentator Rob Kendall. Rob, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Abdul. And we have the three Lindsays with us today. Just sort of <laughs> kind of weird on the on the Indiana Issues schedule. Our good friend, Lindsay Marie Libertarian. Lindsay, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Our other good friend, Democrat, Lindsay Hake. Lindsay, thank you for being here. Of course. Thank you. And Lindsay Adorty uh, from the IBJ. So, Lindsay, thank you. Thank you. I may actually use you ladies' full names, just, just so you know, to help us keep us That's all, all straight. And, and Rob is probably gender fluid, so we'll just call him, <laughs> we'll just call him Rob. Uh, but getting the program started today, folks, uh, Robert's reaction continues uh, to be mixed across the country uh, with the Robert Mueller report saying there was no collusion uh, between Donald Trump and the Russians, but uh, fell short of clearing the president on any issues of obstruction of justice. Uh, reaction from Indiana's congressional delegation uh, has been somewhat mixed. Uh, let's see, go to the board and just show you some of that. Uh, Larry Bouchon uh, saying, after two years of congressional investigations, millions of taxpayer dollars spent in searching for a collusion between Russia and the president's campaign, the special counsel investigation, which had unfettered access uh, to any potential link, has made it clear without a doubt no collusion between President Trump and other Americans. Uh, meanwhile, Congressman Andre Carson from Indianapolis had a little bit of a different reaction, saying the Attorney General's summary of the report is just that, a summary. His assessment of the information provided made in, you know, made in just days unchecked uh, by any outside source. And as it stands now, it's far from a full exoneration of the president. Meanwhile, uh, Jim Banks, I think, was interesting in sort of splitting the difference uh, sort of between the two, saying the president was all right all along, but more Americans should be outraged about the Mueller report showed that the Russians did, beyond a shadow of a doubt, try to meddle with our election process. So an said, interest reaction from three members of Indiana's congressional delegation. Uh, Lindsay Hake, let's start with you. Uh, your thoughts, your reaction on the Mueller report. I think we need to see it. I think the American people deserve no less. And I agree with the majority of Americans that were polled this week that said they agree. And don't think that this, this exonerates Trump in any way. And we deserve to read it. We may as well. I was excited when I was a kid to read the Star Report, and I'd be excited to read this one. Lindsay? I definitely agree they should release it um, and as much as they can with a little redaction if possible. Um, but I think the outrage on the left is interesting. Um, they, a lot of people seem very angry that the results came out the way that they did. If it were me, I would be happy that my president um, was not a puppet for Russia or another foreign government. But, hey, you know, everyone has their own opinions. <laughs> uh, uh, Lindsay, uh, what, what, do you, what is your reaction to sort of the media reaction and all this? Because it seemed like you know, the media sort of gets worked up and it's almost sort of, you know, ready for, for the big thing. Then all of a sudden it feels like, OK, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good summary of how the media <laughs> felt about it, um, especially when it was coming out, you know, oh, the report's about to be released. Oh, he has sent it to the attorney general. Like there was all this buildup and then we end up with a four page summary. And so I think there are probably a lot of reporters out there pushing to get the full report <laughs> or hoping that it gets leaked somehow. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how much trickles out, how much we're able to find out. I mean, because as we've seen over the past two years, a lot of things are are leaked in D.C. So, <laughs> Amongst other places. Uh, Rob, <laughs> let me ask you, uh, the president, uh, as we record this program, uh, was in Michigan this week, you know, once again, talk about how exonerated he was, no collusion. Uh, but Hell seemed, of a rally, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but but seemed to almost sort of skip over the fact that, you know, the, the report didn't, you know, they did not make, it's not clear him on, you know, any sort of obstruction of justice. Now, there was a theory which I think is a logical one that if there's an, if there's no underlying crime, there's really nothing to obstruct per se. But they still did not clear him on obstruction of justice. So Connie Lawson and secretaries of state across the country, Democrats and Republicans alike, came to us two and a half years ago when this was all launched. Said you can't hack the U.S. election system. I don't know what collusion is, but it certainly wasn't hacking the U.S. election system. To Lindsay's point, shouldn't we be hearing relief? from the Democrats. Oh, thank God, the the president of the United States didn't collude with the Russians. Instead, it's okay to include with the Russians, but there was obstruction of justice. In America, you are innocent until proven guilty. There's no underlying crime, as you said, yet we're still in search of a crime. I, I don't know where we go from here, other than this was a big waste of time. Uh, but let me ask, throw this out to the entire panel. Uh, was this, in a sense, a waste of time, but the fact that there were still, you know, what sort of stemmed from this investigation into, you know, alleged collusion, still turned into 45-something-odd indictments and seven people, you know, getting, you no know, felony, felony crimes? Yeah, but I think 
with Trump and who he was surrounding himself with, like Manafort, when you're, you're around those people, you know the kind of stuff that they do. He kind of got himself in trouble by firing uh, Comey, and he started br- sort of brought this upon himself. I don't necessarily think that some of these things wouldn't have come out otherwise, because um, I think Manafort was probably on a lot of people's radar for a very long time. So I think, yes, it should have been investigated, but also it went on a lot longer than it probably should have. I still just want to see the report. Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> Rudy Giuliani said, ah, no big deal. We don't need to to, uh, to make this public. There's nothing to show. You know, if that's the case, then why are we hiding it? That's what I'd like to see. And so I am I am hopeful that there's something that's, uh, frankly, above board. And there doesn't have to be a leak. And there can be something just, hey, here we go. Here's here's what the American public can see. And if there's nothing to show, then then fine. What are you scared of? Release it. But the one thing I noticed, uh, Lindsay Ardodi, is in a lot of these situations, it is never the underlying crime that gets a lot of these folks in trouble because usually the, the crime you know, didn't happen or you couldn't prove all the elements of it. It's the cover-up. It's the you know, not being honest with investigators, you know, lying about this, lying about that. So I always kind of wonder why people just don't tell the truth. <laughs> well, that's a great question. And if someone could answer that, then I don't know. I mean, as a, as a reporter, I always hope that people are telling the truth, but that's not always the case. And I think that's why a lot of people put so much faith in this report because they thought it was going to answer all of their questions. And I think people still have questions they want answered, especially when it came to the obstruction of justice issue. So we'll we'll see what happens going forward. Rob, why didn't half these guys just tell the truth? Well, that's the question, right? Because Manafort goes to jail for nothing to do with the election, right? Feeling to register as a foreign agent, tax evasion. Michael Cohen goes to jail for lying to Congress. Flynn is in trouble for lying. Like, there's no underlying crime, as you mentioned, right? And as we've talked about many times at WIBC, if you can't tell the truth to the FBI, don't say anything at all. (laughs) Or at least get a good lawyer. (laughs) And and as he said, we might recommend Abdul because if he doesn't win, your pizza's free. (laughs) Or something like that. Reasonable doubt for reasonable fee. At least he'll cash your check faster than anybody else. I mean, that's the thing, right? You talked about that from the beginning, and we've talked about that many times on WIBC, which is, much like with Scooter Libby, it wasn't the underlying crime. It's lying about not being involved in the underlying crime. Don't ever lie to the FBI unless you're Hillary Clinton. (laughs) Or something like that. Our guests today are conservative commentator Rob Kendall, Libertarian Lindsay Marie, Democrat Lindsay Hake, and from the IBJ, Lindsay Ardotti. You're watching Indiana Issues, coming to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Annapolis as we look back uh, on the week's and past couple of week's events. Uh, Another big item uh, this week at the Indiana General Assembly, the Indiana House moving forward uh, on the issue of bias crimes, 57 to 39. They did earlier this week as we taped this program to adopt the statutes that some say are leaving other Hoosiers out. Uh, it considers, uh, the course law consider the, the victim's race, creed, credibility, uh, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, but not necessarily gender, and it is not directly included in uh, that particular statute, but instead referred to another biased crime statute. Uh, Lindsay Doty, uh, you were with us when we spoke to the speaker uh, this week. Uh, what did, what, how, did the, how did House Republicans explain their logic and rationale? House Republicans, including House Speaker Brian Bosma, think that this is the most inclusive option they could have come up with because of the wording that's in the beginning of the amendment that says, you know, any trait, any characteristic, any attribute. And then it says, including but not limited to, and references a different part of state code that has that list. So to them, even if it's not in that list, it is covered because of the beginning of the amendment. Now, Democrats disagree with that, but that's how Republicans feel. So do the advocates out in the hallways who are working on this uh, conglomeration of folks working for, uh, you know, corporate faith, uh, NGO interests, and and no one's on board with this in the coalition Indiana Ford. So we're we're sitting here wondering, uh, you know, how this moved forward, especially given the fact that the Anti-Defamation League has issued concern with it not getting Indiana off the list. Uh, so I really, I hesitate to see uh, anything move forward. Uh, but the calendar's out for Monday and it's not on there. So we'll see if it comes forth on Tuesday. Uh, one of the things, though, uh, with respect to uh, this particular issue, because uh, there was always talk about, you know, if you, have a, if, you, if you have a list of enumerated protected classes, you run the risk of leaving someone off. Is, is, it, is this sort of way to sort of include everybody? It's, it's almost like having a job where it says, you know, your duties are this, this, and this. And by the way, other duties as... As needed. As, as, as needed or as, as assigned. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, the answer is no. Uh, it needs to be specific. And the broad concern still has ADL's worry. And that's that's why we, as Indiana Ford, would still say that this doesn't go far. 
enough. I, th- I think you, it's worth pointing out, though, that the Indiana Chamber of Commerce has said they do support it. So not, there's some disagreement about whether or not it's good enough. And that's something uh, Lindsay Mayer thought was interesting because uh, to go to uh, Lindsay uh, Hicks' point, you know, some of the advocates are not in favor, but you know, whereas the Indiana Chamber supports it, the Indi- the Indy Chamber does not. And the, I want to say the American Family Institute folks like it, but the Indiana Family Institute right. doesn't. So if you made everybody mad, that means this must be the way to go. <laughs> well, the thing is, if I think people are arguing that some groups are being left out or it's not inclusive enough. And I look at it and I think to myself, what we're doing is creating even more protected classes and we're elevating crimes against certain people and saying they are worse than crimes against this person. And if you want everyone to be included, you don't make a list. You make every crime against no matter who the person is treated the same way. If it's against me, you or anybody else. When you start making subgroups, that's whenever you're making things not fair and you're going to leave people out. But don't we already do that in the sense that when we look at you know, the way you know, a crime against a child has always been treated differently differently? You know, then a crime against an adult, a crime against a senior citizen, uh, somebody with a fiduciary duty, like, say, responsible for, like, a caregiver. Stealing money is a, is a worse offense than stealing money, just say, from a, you know, a regular person. I mean, don't we already do this with our, with our criminal do, code? We do, but we don't need to keep going down that rabbit hole if we can stop it at this point. I think the best plan of action is to leave it as is, and it would be better if we could start rolling back other things. But at this point, to just keep tacking these on, we're not getting anywhere. This is not going to end up well for anybody. Let me get Rob to jump in here. Well, I hate to be the person that points out the incompetence of the Indiana legislature, but we've had this statute that they're citing in the House on the books since 2003. And it took a reporter in his subscription-based <laughs> publication, everyone subscribed to the cheat sheet, by the way, to point this out to them that all you got to do is reference this. And it's taken care of. And it's almost like I can picture Brian Bosma in his office. The light goes off over his head. Voila! Problem solved. These are the people representing us. This should be very concerning to everyone. Now, I I will say this, and I'll do fairness to the speaker. He actually was thinking about this this past summer. The question was, could you do this in such a way, uh, and Lindsay Erdogan, correct me if I'm wrong, the the, the trick was, how do you do this in a way that you'd actually get it to pass his particular chamber? Yeah, well, and one of the things that he talked about as this first started playing out this session was getting Indiana off the list without a list. So... While the idea of referencing a list may have been tossed around, I think the initial goal was to do it without a list because the thought was that you could get more votes on it that way. Then they started to realize, well, we're not going to get off the list without a list, so we're going to need to go can, to a different can, plan. Can we talk about Governor Tax and Spin, by the way? <laughs> he hates the Senate bill because it doesn't have a list. This one still doesn't have a list. It referenced something that's been on the books since 2003. He knows he's looking bad and the conservative base is mad at him, so he goes, how about the House? Victory! Oh, okay. I got to switch you to decaf. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. This is who, these are the people making decisions for us. But no, me, I think there definitely speaks to a lack of leadership on all sides of this issue. Uh, it needs more direction. It needs more gusto. Maybe they could borrow some of yours. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly, uh, I think this weekend will be critical. And while I've heard that there's an expect an expected consent on on two on 189 sorry uh by senator bohacek i i know the advocacy groups are calling for for a dissent uh or excuse, excuse me i used the word, the incorrect word uh, concur uh uh but yes i think what we need to move forward towards is is a definitive and specific policy statement for indiana that's not the title 10 reference that's ancient and and moves forward in terms of getting us into a national attention space that's not negative uh, let me ask you this, uh, Lindsay, before we take a quick break here. Do advocates run the risk of letting, as an old saying, Mitch Daniels staff, by letting perfect be the enemy of good? Yeah, I love that quote. <laughs> um, but this, in this instance, it uh, we need perfect. We need, Indiana has just received too much negative attention. And, and I worry, you know, I just recently moved back to Indiana from having moved away for a few years, and I saw how people outside of the state view this issue. And it's just sad. Uh, we, we are better than this, and that's what we deserve. You're watching Indiana Issues, coming to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. I'm your host, Abdul Kim Shabazi, editor and publisher of IndiePolitics.org. Uh, when we come back with our panel, we'll talk about some recent developments in the case involving Indiana Attorney General Curtis Hill and uh, South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg get some good news in his quest for the presidency. You're watching Indiana Issues. We'll be right back.
And welcome back to Indiana Issues. I'm your host, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndiePolitics.org, coming to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. Our panel today are conservative commentator Rob Kendall from WIBC Radio, uh, Lindsay Marie, a uh, libertarian of national prominence and fame, Lindsay Haig, a uh, Democratic strategist here in the state of Indiana, and Lindsay Erdoti uh, from the IBJ. Uh, the algorithm that puts together our panel just got all the Lindsays together <laughs> to today, so this is how this is how we do it, folks. Uh, Attorney General Curtis Hill, uh, making new again this past couple of weeks, uh, faced a potential loss of his license to practice law, a complaint filed uh, with the State Disciplinary Commission, uh, that is the, the body uh, that investigates lawyers for alleged uh, misconduct, uh, basically saying that the Attorney General committed sexual battery, uh, but not coming necessarily back uh, with the recommendations uh, as to how the court should handle this, saying, hey, you can suspend his license, revoke his license, or just give him a, a slap on the wrist. Uh, the Attorney General planning to vigorously defend uh, these allegations, all stemming from an incident last March uh, at a sunny dive uh, legislative party. Uh, Lindsay Erdurdy, uh let me start with you. Uh, can Curtis Hill survive this? That's an interesting question, and I think we've actually talked about this months ago on this show in terms of, you know, what does his future look like? And I think I said then, and I think I would say now, that 2020 is still a ways away, and this could be on the last thing on voters' minds by the time we get to that point. So it will be interesting to see how this plays out. I think a lot of it depends on what the outcome of this complaint is. If we actually see disciplinary action taken against him, I think that changes things. And see, and that's what makes it uh, sort of interesting is because under state law, the, the attorney general must be licensed to practice law in Indiana. And uh, Lindsey Hake, it, it seems to be pretty clear what the outcome would be if the attorney general's license is completely revoked or if he's given a slap on the wrist. The question is, what happens if his license is temporarily suspended? I mean, that's a question to be answered and, and to to see there's no legislative or or at least action so far on this. And at, at this point, I just see a bunch of hands up at the state house. You know, no one seems to want to touch this. And to answer the first question, I think he, of course, can survive this. He's shown that it clearly doesn't matter, uh, you know, whether folks whether folks uh, know about the allegations or not. And uh, he continues to be sought after by the D.C. elite that are in charge of this drama that we see unfolding in front in the beltway so you know i really don't see this being an issue for curtis hill but you know i feel bad for the dude i really do for someone who doesn't realize it any way shape or form can still walk into that building every day uh knowing that he that he is um that he has just acted dishonorably um, allegations aside allegations uh Lindsay, let me uh get you to, to, to throw in here for a second because like i said it is you know Kind of one of those things that, you know, what do you do if, you know, if the license is suspended? And uh, to get to you know, Lindsay Erdy's, Erdy's point, you know, there is 2020 an election next year. You know, what's to stop them? And there's no timetable for the Supreme Court to have to come back, you know, with a decision saying, no, we'll just let the voters take care of all this. And then after the election, we'll issue issue a ruling. I think there's a good chance of that actually happening. Um, I don't know that they want to shake the waters too much, but I think voters even now, if you polled everyone in the state of Indiana, I highly doubt most of them could even name him as the attorney general. Most people don't even know the governor's name in their own state. Um, <laughs> or and their when, own state. Exactly. <laughs> and so when I've talked to people in southern Indiana, I'm like, what do you think about this? They're like, Curtis who? They have no idea. So the idea that they don't know now and the fact that maybe by 2020 they will, it's not going to happen. It's our little bubble that we hear about it, we talk about it, we're involved in it to an extent that knows what's going on. If they run campaign ads against them with it in there somehow or they use them, I don't really think that's going to sway voters' minds. It didn't with Trump. It's not going to sway them with this. Speaking of Trump, Rob. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 Here. It, it, this, this does bring up a, a, a rather interesting dichotomy in the sense that everyone was cheering you know, you know, the Republicans, when you know the, the special counsel came back and said, you know what, Donald Trump, no collusion, you no know, unclear on obstructive justice, yay, yay, yay. But when the special prosecutor came back on the Curtis Hill saying, you know what, there's not to prove allegations, it was he still needs to resign, still needs to step down. I got a little artistic this week. I think you actually shared it on Facebook. I crossed out Trump's name and special oh, counsel and that put Curtis well Hill and special prosecutor in there. It's totally hypocritical. Let me say, first of all, Curtis Hill has no one but himself to blame. He put himself in this position. He shouldn't have been doing that. That being said, he didn't commit a criminal violation. He didn't commit an ethics violation. So at this point, you're going to the well for the third time against the only African-American who holds statewide office in the state of Indiana, the leading vote getter in the state of Indiana, and a guy who just happens to be really against the sitting governor. It looks really petty and political. 
You might remember an issue a few years back that dealt with the IURC with an ALJ at the IURC. And just so everybody knows, IURC is the Indian Utility Utility Regulatory Commission, and an ALJ is an administrative law judge. Thank you. I just (laughs) fell into that acronym (laughs) failure that I always lecture about. Don't worry, we're here to translate. Thank you. So uh, that and and that attorney himself, despite being on the stand about these issues and his and, and and his missteps, I'll just say that um, he was never disbarred by the Indiana by by the Supreme Court. Um, is it a forgive me a, a commission the, the, or disciplinary commission? Thank you, disciplinary. Thank you. Um, but yeah, that that panel never acted on that, and so we had an, an indiv- individual who was literally on the stand for his role in this ethics fiasco that was uncovered by John Russell at the Star at that time, and and here we are with with a precedent for it, and and there's no action. No, no offense, Abdul, so. but if we're going to prosecute every attorney that's a creep or acts creepy, <laughs> we're we're in big trouble, right? Again, he did this to himself as the chief law enforcement officer for the state. He never should have been in that position. But if you didn't do anything criminal, it's been fully vetted. You didn't do anything ethical, it's been fully vetted. While you might have acted creepy and inappropriate, that makes you a dude. It doesn't mean you should be disbarred or or not be the attorney general for the state of Indiana. Not every dude. (laughs) Not all of us. Our guests today are conservative Rob Kendall, uh, libertarian Lindsay Marie, Democrat Lindsay Hake, uh, Lindsay Air Dirty from the Indianapolis Business Journal uh, on Indiana Issues Today, coming to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, another big news item, Pete Buttigieg uh, running for president, getting a bit of good news, uh, has surged to third place uh, in the Iowa uh, caucus polls. Uh, from uh, last place just two months ago, if you look on the screen there, uh, you can see Joe Biden last polled at 25 percent, Bernie Sanders 24, Pete Buttigieg 11, and uh, Kamala Harris 10, uh, beating Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Beto O'Rourke. Uh, what does this say? Uh, what does this mean? Uh, obviously, this is good news, uh, Lindsay, from a, Lindsay uh, Hake, from a Democrat perspective, from Mayor Pete, but how long will the good news last? I guess time will only tell. Uh, I mean... I really respect everyone who has hitched onto this wagon of let's just support whomever rises to the top because they will be in better uh, in a better position to take on President Trump. That that to me right now is the right way to go because there's been a lot of hashing over these candidates. There's still this large Bernie Sanders bro component that people are still blaming the the presidency you're on right now currently and and I just don't think that's helpful. So I think he's he's doing great. That CNN town hall really helped him and and let him hit that uh, that uh, ceiling, or excuse me, floor of uh, of contributors. So I, I really hope he continues his work. I think he's he's done Indiana great, and he would put Indiana back on the on the map for for doing good. Um, Lindsay, uh, Marie, how does Pete Buttigieg take it down in Southern Indiana? Does does his name? Pop up? No. Um, and most people have not heard of him, even in southern Indiana. And a lot of people across the country haven't either, which is an issue he's going to be facing as time continues to go on. I think that in within the Democratic primary, he may do well. But when we talk about putting him against Trump, he's not going to be able to get any of those conservative voters who don't like Trump. He's not going to get a never Trumper. He's a progressive in moderate clothing is what he is. When you talk to people that are anti-Trump, they say, well, the reason I'm going to vote for him is because I don't want socialism, because they have this false binary that it's either Trump or we go to socialism. Pete Buttigieg wants to end the Electoral College. He's for Medicare for all. He's hinted at being for universal basic income. Those are some of the socialistic principles that the the left or the right is terrified of. He can't get any of those votes. Well, actually, I will say this. The right is actually wrong on universal basic income. That was actually an idea invented by Milton Friedman, the father of free markets. That's just a little, little <laughs> FYI. Uh, Lindsay Dirty, let me ask you. Uh, uh, obviously, this is good news for Pete Buttigieg. Uh, does he have the, the the stain power? Because some people say that the plus about him is unlike the Cory Booker's and Kamala Harris's who try to invade our works or have more sort of this this rock star kind of flash in the pan status. You know, sometimes slow and steady and just being low key kind of wins the race in the long run. Yeah, I think it's interesting that I feel like we've kind of been asking this question for the past few weeks now. It's like every week we're like, oh, he had a good week. Oh, he had another good week. Like he increased a little (laughs) bit in the polls. So I I think we keep waiting for it. Well, is he going to peak? Like are we going to come back down? Um, But uh, to other Lindsay's point, (laughs) he is still relatively unknown, I think. Um, But again, on the other hand, a different poll, which didn't show him being very well known, when people had heard of him, they had heard mostly positive things. So that's a good sign for him. Um, so I think, again, time will really tell whether or not this continues or not. 
Let me get your thoughts on this, Rob, because one of the things that people say is, you know, what about his name ID and do people know who he is? Now, I would argue name ID is a two-way street because if everybody knows who you are, that usually means everybody's probably also got an opinion of you versus people get to know you, kind of introduce yourself, and you get a chance to shape the narrative. Well, here's the thing. Okay, so there's two front runners. It's Bernie and it's Biden, right? I mean, every poll has them overwhelmingly ahead. And these two guys have one foot on the grave and one foot on a banana peel. This is their last shot. So anytime some of these young up-and-comers, like a Beto, steps up, they're going to destroy this guy, as they've done with Beto. We've seen bad hit after bad hit after bad hit. Pete Buttigieg starting to get on that radar. You're going to start to see the negative stuff come out. They haven't cared until now. Now he's showing up in these polls. They'll start to care. They'll cut him off at the knees. There's dirt on everyone, and these two dudes will find it, and they have the army to take these people down. It's interesting that, so Club for Growth, the conservative organization, has been running attack ads already against Beto, but none of the other Democratic challengers. So it's interesting, based on whatever data they have, that he's the one that they need to make sure does not win that Democratic primary. They're ignoring Pete Buttigieg, and they're ignoring a lot of the other ones right now. Uh, I guess today our good friends, uh, conservative Rob Kendall, libertarian Lindsay Marie, Democrat Lindsay Hake, uh, Lindsay Ordoni from the IBJ. Uh, we're now that uh, near the tail end of our program. We'll make our predictions and prognostications, what we all see in sort of the, the crystal ether uh, with less than 30 days to go before any lawmakers adjourn and call it a day. Uh, Rob, let me start with you. What are you going to be paying attention to? What should our what should our audience look out for? It's this gaming bill. And you told me I had nothing to worry <laughs> about, Abdul. You said it's going to be great. I'm going to get the sports betting. I'm going to get the live dealers. Well, I'm no. going to get the casinos. Well, no, you, you still will get your sports betting. <laughs> I'm very and concerned. Online yeah. but, and you still will get your live dealers. You're just going to get them in 2021 when we're supposed to get them in the first place. I, I've already heard, you know, they're taking the phone app off. Yep, That's a have. thing now. I had, uh, Jason Hammer and I have said this for a long time. We had no doubt Brian Bosma would screw up the sports gaming bill. It appears that's going to happen. <laughs> Lindsay Marie. Um, I'm watching Senate Bill 36, which is the felony registry. Um, it's currently in committee right now. And basically it's going to set up a registry for anyone convicted of a felony. Um, it will have your picture, your most recent address, and multiple identifying factors. And basically what it's going to do, it's going to start blacklisting more and more people who are trying to get that second chance and re make or make a new life for themselves. Lindsay Hake. I'm hopeful that Governor vetoes Senate Bill 471, which would put a huge chilling effect on the First Amendment here in the state by enhancing a felony, uh, bump, actually bumping up a felony for trespassing and throwing a $100,000 fine on folks who uh, who have happened to organize any type of uh, protest on on private property. So I think that's going to going to hopefully earn the the veto that we've seen in other states from other conservative governors. And hope Governor Holcomb does the right thing. Lindsay Dirty. I am watching Senate Bill 7, which is the bill that provides the funding mechanisms for the Capital Improvement Board in Indianapolis and is tied to keeping the Indiana Pacers uh, in the city for the next 25 years. Uh, I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that since there's a group of hotel owners downtown that are very upset about the bill, are planning this whole at attack marketing plan, and we'll we'll see how it shakes out. Uh, we're keeping an eye on legislation that would go to Indiana's property tax caps, uh, particularly stormwater fees. Is that story that is still out there? It's gotten delayed and uh, stalled because a bunch of judges don't want jurisdiction taken away from the tax court. But I still maintain this has the potential to be the ticking time bomb that would make all other previous tax bombs seem small by comparison. Our guests today have been conservative Rob Kendall, Libertarian Lindsay Marie, Democrat Lindsay Hake, and Lindsay Ordoni from the IBJ. Lindsay, thank you all very much for being with us. Thank and you. Rob, you too. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. Uh, and also, a thanks, big thanks to our friends here at the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. Thanks for being with us. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndiePolitics.org. And we'll see you next time on Indiana Issues. Perfect, 29.45.